I'm Dr. Don Bowdish. I'm an immunologist at McMaster University and the Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity. Awesome. Um, so when we think about, um, you know, even asymptomatic um, SARS-CoV-2 infections, um, I, I'm just reminded of a very early story I wrote um, from The Lancet um, in which uh, doctors in um, uh, Shenzhen and Hong Kong described this 10 or 11 year old boy whose family, who was part of a family group that went to Wuhan over New Year and many of them are infected. The parents um, definitely were sick. The, the children weren't, uh, or at least the son wasn't. Um, and the, the parents insisted that, um, that he have a, a, a CT scan of his lungs, just like the rest of the family members were scanned. And the doctors basically humored the parents and went, all right, well, he's asymptomatic. Let's <laughs> have a look. And sure enough, he had this sort of fulminant... Um, pneumonia um, going on, um, yet it was otherwise well. Um, and uh, and they, they raised the question, you know, what's going on with this virus? Are people going to be asymptomatically infected? Um, so it was quite clear. And I think that study was, you know, in January of 2020. So, um, yeah, it just, I was always intrigued by that. And sure enough, we saw lots of reports of varying levels of asymptomatic infection and transmission and mm -hmm. So, um, and then, you know, we've, yeah, I'm, so I'm sort of curious to know where, what your thinking is and what you've observed. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, to give you a bit of background in my pre-COVID life, before I uh, was sort of pivoted to COVID, I, my research interest was serious infections in mid to late life and the long-term health consequences. So for decades, we've known that having pneumonia or influenza especially mid to late life can accelerate a lot of bad things, you know, dementia and metabolic disorders and all sorts of challenges. And uh, I often felt that I was sort of screaming into a void because, you know, people didn't want to necessarily, um, people want their infectious disease to be acute. You know, you go to the hospital, you get out of the hospital, or you, you know, you take two weeks off work if it's really bad and then life goes on. But the fact of the matter is the amount of metabolic energy it takes to, to run an immune response and, and then the when you have one of these serious infections and COVID definitely being in, in uh, this category, your immune system is really fighting against a virus or a bacteria that uh, is fighting for its life. And so it leads to misdirection and it can cause your immune system to go off target. And what we're really seeing in the context of COVID is that this battle between an immune response and the virus is really leading to this misdirection. And so people uh, who have even mild infections sometimes are appearing with uh, things that look like precursors to autoimmunity or other major health issues. So. Um, we moved into this uh, COVID study that you're referring to because in early uh, sort of March 2020 in Canada, we didn't, we like many parts of the world, were out of everything. You know, we didn't have good, we didn't have enough swabs for testing. We didn't have uh, people getting diagnosed. We had people being told by the doctor that it was probably COVID without actually a diagnosis. And so we'd invited uh, some people to the lab um, to give blood and uh, to figure out if they had had COVID or not. And the thing that, you know, our definition of mild in our paper is mild, mild, mild compared to many definitions of mild. You know, sometimes people use the phrase mild as in hospitalized, but lived or needed medical care, but got over it. But our, our, the people in our study were really, really mild. So they had either, either they were asymptomatic or they had conditions that they could manage at home. And these aren't even folks who were um, really reporting long COVID per se. They had sort of resolved their system, their, their uh, symptoms. And yet we could still see that there were immune changes in these folks, you know, a month uh, or two months after infections. And so to me, the big mystery here is why is this virus so unusual in its ability uh, to sort of cause this misdirection and harm of the immune system? Because if in, in our study, if you look at the symptoms of the people who thought they had COVID but didn't, because in that particular time frame, we had lots of 
RSV in Canada, so respiratory syncytial virus, which can cause COVID-like symptoms. We had a ton of influenza that year. We had a particularly bad, March 2020 was a bad time in Canada to get an illness because there was a lot going around. So we've got two groups of people. One group of people who had something that to them looked and felt like COVID, you know, they had off work for two weeks or they, you know, they, they felt really poorly. Um, and then we had the COVID patients. And when we compared them up to nine months later, we could see that there were some differences in level of inflammation and immune dysfunction um, in the people who had COVID compared to the other respiratory infections. So it just speaks to the fact that COVID really is different, you know, and it really is worse because at the time there was a lot of question about like, well, you know, is it really any worse than the flu or is it just more people have it? And, and our data is definitely consistent with other groups who've compared long haul symptoms to people who've had influenza and said, you know what, actually it is different. You know, people who have had influenza often have a long and difficult recovery and can have respiratory symptoms and brain fog and these things, but you are more likely to have those symptoms and you're likely to have them for longer if you have had COVID. So you looked at things like ESR, CRP as, as sort of biomarkers of inflammation? Correct. So we looked at CRP because that's a very common measure that people might look like. And, you know, I, I will uh, definitely say that our study shows this is a very subtle long-term inflammation. So we're not hitting levels of CRP where you'd go to the doctor and they, that would trigger uh, that would trigger some sort of medical concern. We're still looking a lot of what we look at in my lab in the context of aging, uh, recovery from infections, people get back down to the normal range, but the normal range is really big and really generous. And so we know that over time, things uh, that keep you in the normal range, but just push you up a little bit higher than you would have been normally can have long-term health consequences. So we looked at CRP, which like you said, is a, a common clinical measure of, of inflammation. And we also looked at some changes in the circulating and function of some of the immune cells. SARS-CoV-2 has a very strange relationship with T cells. It's got a very bizarre relationship. If I were to show you any of my pre-COVID lectures on what happens after you get a lung infection, and any textbook would tell you that you have this sudden uh, and really strong increase in neutrophil numbers and they go and they deal with the infection and you know, T cell numbers uh, don't change because those are cells that take a long time to, to sort of build up and contribute to the immune response. So they're not part of your acute response. And yet people with SARS-CoV-2, they have this incredible loss of T cells. CD4, and CD8, what we show uh, sort of across the board, they lose them. Uh, they, they go way down and to the point where the degree to which you have less of them in your blood is a good marker of whether or not you're gonna survive. And what we found in our study is that uh, these folks had definitely in the normal range of the T cells. And again, they have very, very mild infections. So that's not surprising, but their T cells uh, looked a little bit weird. They, they had this um, uh, hyper inflammation profile and there were some markers of activation even months later that uh, we wouldn't normally see. And again, we were comparing people with COVID and people who had other infections of equal severity, but were not COVID. And I think this just speaks to the fact that we are all scratching our heads and asking, what is it about SARS-CoV-2? Why does it seem to have this effect on T cells? And is that a long-term contributor to some of the effects that people who have long COVID have? So do you describe that as um, lymphopenia? Mm. Correct, correct. So lymphopenia means a uh, decrease in the circulating number of T cells, and that's a huge marker of severity. And like I said, our, our folks had recovered, so they got back to normal levels, but there was some evidence that, that um, these T cells took a little while to recover. And we also, you know, there's another strange, no, no, there's another unfortunate effect of having SARS-CoV-2 infections is that we know that people have increased hospitalization rates and healthcare utilization after they've had SARS-CoV-2 for seemingly unrelated things. So, you know, people who end up with SARS-CoV-2 infections and have a higher chance of going back to the hospital for something totally unrelated. And as an immunologist, we feel strongly that that's partly because of this immune dysregulation is going to have broad impacts on, on multiple systems in the body. Yeah, so I'm just thinking if, you know, we've had 
probably around the world, a billion um, SARS-CoV-2 infections. And if, if they sort of push up the baseline of inflammation, um, um, I mean, in my mind, inflammation is wear and tear on the body. Mm-hmm. Um, so does that equate to more heart disease, diabetes, neurodegenerative, you know, to ch- changes? Yeah, this would be my prediction. So like I said, in my pre-COVID life, I used to study how having pneumonia or influenza in sort of mid to late life, because that sort of is an easy area. Sorry. Is it from age 50? 50, yeah, 50 ish. Um, it can affect have long-term health consequences. And uh, certainly the classic ones are cognitive decline, um, and metabolic disorders, um, myocardial infarction, so heart attacks, big increased rate in heart attacks, especially in the next three years. So dealing with a, a severe infection is hard work for your immune system, really hard work. And as a consequence, there's sort of, like I said, this misdirection where you have these immune responses to, to other things, but also the systemic inflammation. As we get older, we're less good at resolving it. So we have these big bumps of inflammation when we get sick, but sometimes they don't go back down to that, that level. And a lot of like the chronic health conditions that occur with aging, like you mentioned heart disease, dementia, um, type two diabetes, uh, pretty much everything actually you can list are all associated with elevated inflammation. And so one of the things, you know, I'd been really annoyed at the media, certainly here in Canada, and I'm, I'm fairly certain in Australia as well, there was a real, especially in the early days, a real like belief that either SARS-CoV-2 infections were like mild and you kind of got over them. It was just the flu. Yes, some old people might end up in the hospital. But what we really weren't emphasizing is this middle ground where having one of these infections might have longer term health consequences. And certainly at the long COVID survivors um, can speak very poignantly about what how that has affected their life. But even for people who don't relate to having long COVID, we will see statistically significant increases in the number of people developing these conditions, or they'll be developing them earlier than we would have predicted had they not had the infection. Yeah, I look, I think that you cannot understate the significance for policy. Um, Mm -hmm. When you consider, you know, do we just let this virus wash over our population? Or do we do a lot to stop community transmission? From the very beginning, I was, you know, my, my daughter teases me to no end because I was quoted in our CBC, which is, I guess, the equivalent of your ABC. Uh, and I had said, no COVID is good COVID. You know, we can have no COVID because of the long-term health consequences. And, uh, you know, countries that either do COVID zero approaches or really minimize, they're saving themselves a lot of money in the long run. Right. Whereas we already know that countries like the UK, who had a lot of COVID, but also have really good health records, you know, the lost time off work, you know, the increased healthcare utilization, the increased hospitalization, those are costs that add up. They're not the acute costs of the infection, but they are costs that add up. And across the developed world, with an aging population who live longer with more chronic health conditions, tremendous cost to society, tremendous cost to society. And so I really worry about what this is going to do for us in the long term. Definitely. My my fourth episode uh, in this podcast series is actually it's quite an interesting one. It's um, two best friends. Um, one is a medical doctor and one is a neuroscientist um, discussing the fact that the medical doctor, uh, they're both in their late 20s, um, caught COVID on the front lines working you know, as a registrar in a busy hospital, mm-hmm. uh, lost a sense of smell, and a year later, has still got hyposmia. Um, mm-hmm. And what is that going to do to her long-term health? Um, and because her friend who studies olfaction in neurodegenerative diseases mm-hmm. um, is is really worried for her. Um, mm-hmm. And so the, the the dynamic was really interesting, where the the bet you know the they were very frank and upfront um, with each other. Um, uh, and it was made great audio for my podcast um, because, you know, it's such a big unknown, but the, the signs are, are pointing to not a good place. Um, 
you know, the UK biobank study with looking at the brain imaging. Um, oh, that was a depressing one. Oh, that was, yeah, that was, that was a very depressing study. I have to say. And in truth, you know, the studies have not been as well controlled for pneumonia and influenza, which was, you know, my past passion, but same story, right? Like not so much with the, um, with the loss of smell, that isn't so much a feature, but that people who were in these longitudinal studies where they did IQ tests um, and then they would get pneumonia and then they do their IQ test and, and they would find that there was a quantitative difference in uh, IQ in these folks later. It's, you know, infectious disease is something that I think the world really thinks of like as a time limited problem. You know, it's you get sick, you get better. You know, people who are hospitalized for pneumonia, well, they don't, they leave the hot, they get their antibiotics, they leave the hospital and life goes on. But any country that collects good health records and actually in, uh, American um, uh, HMOs are really good for this because they're very uh, meticulous about costing, um, have found that those folks are gonna cost a lot more money over time and they're gonna develop these things earlier. So when we think about, the, the economic cost of infections, obviously we're all in the acute phase right now and it's bad, but there's gonna be a long, long-term long consequence to this. And it, it, it has all sorts of strange knock-on effects too. So for example, people retire and leave the workforce earlier if they either have chronic health conditions or they have a loved one who has a chronic health condition. Um, many of the developed worlds, Australia and Canada included, you know, we both have labor shortages of like of highly trained people and sort of um, and sort of midlife. And, you know, having people leave to deal with chronic health issues is a, as a double economic cost, both the cost to our healthcare systems, but also the cost to our labor market. So, you know, we really need to be, and I wish we'd had the time to really educate our politicians and policymakers at the beginning of this pandemic about why pursuing a COVID zero approach is, the economically beneficial one in both the short and the long term. But unfortunately, there was just so much concern about the here and now, you know, the loss of businesses and all these other things that that we weren't able to really describe how costly this is going to be in the long run. I worry too um, with the vaccines. Sure, the vaccines are going to be protective against um, severe illness, hospitalization and and death. Um, But we already know that um, they're not protective necessarily against um, long COVID in break from breakthrough infections. And uh, are we really doing ourselves a disservice if we think, great, I'm vaccinated, I'm invincible, it doesn't matter if I get COVID, or do we need to still be masking, avoiding mass gatherings, uh, looking at well-ventilated spaces, doing everything we can to avoid getting SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, my postdoc who worked on the study we're talking about has said, you know, about halfway through, she said, you know, I'm not worried about getting sick with COVID now. I'm worried about what could happen to me if I get COVID later. And certainly I am trying to make the decisions to eliminate my risk because I, I am cautiously optimistic that one day we'll get the boosters to the variants we need because all of us have been vaccinated we're vaccinated against the regional strain. And the fact that we're getting the degree of protection with the variants that are now circulating is actually pretty remarkable. Um, and my hope is that now that we we understand which uh, vaccines we have to build, that we'll have boosters that will be variant specific and then we'll be okay. You know, Then we can go out and we'll get really what we call sterilizing immunity, meaning that you don't carry it. You don't even get a, you know, very rare to get a mild infection unless you're old or immunocompromised. And then I think we can get back to normal. But I think, you know, as of right now, we still, you, even if you're vaccinated, you probably don't want to get COVID. You'll probably, you know, you, you'll probably do better. You, you probably do better. You'll probably, if you do get COVID after you're vaccinated, you know, your chance of having bad things happen is definitely going to be less and your long-term health co- okay. But we, like you said, we don't really know how well protected we are against long COVID. And that's uh, pretty upsetting. But I mean, the good news is, on the other hand, is people who do have long COVID, some of them experience some relief after vaccination, which speaks to directing that immune uh, response appropriately, right? People who have had long 
long COVID uh, generally look like they had pretty wimpy um, immune responses to the virus. And as a consequence, the virus had lots of opportunity to cause this misdirection. And when they have an appropriate immune response, they seem, some of them seem to improve. So I have to believe that uh, if we were all armed with an appropriate immune response, then it wouldn't be a, an issue. But the issue is now we, we're in this weird stage where we've been vaccinated against a virus that doesn't exist, but that's still the best thing we've got to protect us um, from the current variants. Yeah, do you think that there may be some level of um virus viral persistence you know viral proteins viral rna um could that be um what yeah is you know it's, it's funny when i saw the first uh study that came out that said there was some evidence of viral persistence in long covid patients i was like no no i'm not buying it um but as a scientist, I'm good at changing my mind if, when presented with evidence. So in general, the seasonal coronaviruses, the relatives of SARS-CoV-2 do seem to not have the virus persist, but some of their nucleic acids, their RNA do seem to stick around. And there's some hypothesis that uh, this may be one of the reasons that, um, you know, sometimes we have we did, people test positive for a very long time, even if they don't have infectious viruses because SARS-CoV-2 works the same way. So that would be a non-viable virus, but just a little bit of its nucleic acids. There've been some other studies that have shown in long COVID patients that there do seem to be little places where, you know, a very, very low amount of virus. And the hypothesis is that the people who are then vaccinated and feel relief, it's because the vaccine is stepping up and clearing all that virus out and they're fine. Uh, and then the other two thirds of, of people who have long COVID and are not um, improved by vaccination, maybe they never had any viral persistence. They're, what they're suffering from is their immune system that's now targeting their organs or you know, various other things. So I'm, I'm still agnostic about the, the, whether it's a viable bit of virus that these people have, or if it's just a bit of the protein and nucleic acid acids that have hung around because we know the immune system for other infections and sometimes other things that it's dealing with does sometimes keep things around for a while to keep showing the immune system and to keep educating it. So I'm a little bit agnostic about the viral persistence yet, but I definitely think the evidence is building towards that happening in a subset of patients. Were you able to look at specific um, immune profiles, you know, HLA types, anything like that to see whether there were any differences? Yeah, our study would have been too small to find anything like that. You know, in the early days of the pandemic, there was so much chitter chatter about uh, HLA types. So, oh, you know, people of Asian descent seem to be less affected. Or, oh, people of Iranian descent seems to be. And none of that's really panned out, you know, and it really does seem like it was behavioral policy chain things, not to genetics. Um, so I think we're still, I think the, the idea that there may be uh, HLA types associated with infection in general is probably not going to happen. What will be really interesting to figure out is for long COVID specifically, if there are some uh, HLA types, because uh, different populations do have different susceptibilities to various autoimmune conditions. So understanding that genetic link to autoimmunity and the fact that women are more likely to get long COVID is, um, you know, another feature that sort of speaks to a more autoimmune and we might end up finding like people of Northern European descent uh, may end up being more likely to be affected by that just because we tend to be more affected by uh, um, autoimmunity in general. So we'll have to see. Mm. Um, I've got to go because uh, I've got another meeting in four minutes, but are there other people you would recommend I try to talk to? Yeah, so I said in my email, my colleague Sarah Spenningson has some very terrifying pictures of lungs of people who had uh, no very mild symptoms or no symptoms. Right. So, and um, like interstitial you know, lung. Um, yeah. Disease. So I um I, I said to her, I said, you know, Sarah, I'm no respirologist, but even I can tell that that's bad news. So she's got some very scary pictures of lungs. Okay. Yeah. I did I did a story on um, but that was more looking at severe lung injury for ARDS in COVID patients and needing requiring double lung transplants. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, if it's more like this 10 year old boy who had no symptoms, but, but clearly it changes on, on CT images. Um, 
that's interesting. Yeah. And my other colleague, I told you about Manelli, she's looking at the autoimmune story and finding that a lot of these people, and she's actually a long COVID survivor herself. Okay, cool. So she can speak from both the patient and the scientist perspective. All right. Excellent. And um, what are you up to now? Like, where's your next? um, Uh, Well, it's almost dinner time here. I've got young kids early. (laughs) No, I meant um, what's your... Scientifically. um, Yeah. Right now, our biggest uh, study, well, we've got two big studies going on with uh, COVID. One is understanding long-term care, vaccination responses and long-term care, because we see a spectrum of people who have immune responses that are just like a young person and people who are totally impaired and trying to figure that out. Um, And then we also have a vaccine study on um, patients on immunomodulatory drugs. So people with like rheumatoid arthritis and, and uh, they were all excluded from the clinical trials. Yeah. So when they go, when they say to their doctor, you know, is the vaccine going to be safe? Is it going to be work? Because I'm on this immunosuppressant drug. There's no answers for them. And, you know, as a patient group, they're really, they're so stressed out, you know, it's really difficult. So, totally. so for them, we're trying to get them some answers. And again, you know, there's a huge range. And so trying to tease apart which are the features of the disease they have and the drugs that they are on are kind of interesting. So that's that's that takes up most of my day. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for the chat. Um, it was great to meet you. And um, yeah. you'll definitely chase up your uh, colleagues. They sound really interesting as well. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck with your podcast. Thank you. Take care. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.